It's mid-September, and that means we're headed right into one of my favorite bites of the year. And we're going to talk about those Browns of October on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. Hey guys, Chad Lachance here. Thanks as always for tuning into this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast brought to us as it is every week by the fine folks at Sportsman's Warehouse. Visit them at sportsmans.com or any one of 140 plus stores nationwide, including a couple of brand new ones in Florida. Fantastic to see the company doing like they're doing, growing like crazy. So Guys, it's the middle of September, and that makes me happy and sad at the same time, because as a guy who's not particularly a huge fan of wintertime, I realize that my summer's winding down, so that's not always great. However, fall is my favorite season uh, as an outdoorsman, because I dearly love to hunt and fish, and this is the time of year where I'm torn every morning when I get up. Do I go hunt something to put in the freezer or go fishing or what? We shoot a lot of Fishful Thinker content this time of year as well uh, for the coming year's television shows and YouTube channels and all of that. So it's a busy time of year for us around here. But one thing we do, whether I'm filming it or not, is we will take time and go visit a quality brown trout fishery somewhere around my state. Now, I live in Colorado, so we have a lot of brown trout fisheries around here. Uh, If you don't live where there's brown trout, maybe you live where there's brook trout, and some of the same principles will apply as far as that goes. But if you're, a, if you're a trout guy at any level, you probably love late September and all the way through maybe Halloween even. And I do, that's for certain. And part of it is because of how the fish look. I mean, at the end of the day, brown trout being fall spawners are absolutely beautiful fish. They get that nice golden hue with the big red spots on them and typically will develop some sort of a kipe on their jaw as well, at least on the males. And uh, and they just get really, really aggressive. They look like sports car fish. And I think one of the reasons I like brown trout more than the other trout, because they are my favorite of the trout species, uh, is because they are the most aggressive in general. They're the ones most inclined to eat big baits. They're the ones most inclined to chase something down. They're the ones most inclined to defend territories against other trout. Um, they're just very aggressive. They have a doesn't play well with others attitude, which I think is fantastic in a fish. Uh, it makes them really fun to fish for. And it's about this time of year, just about now, when we first start getting the first leaves that are starting to change colors and starting to feel a little bit like fall first thing in the morning. Uh, these are the days that the browns are starting to get really nice. They're already colored up. I've seen a couple of them in the last week. They're getting their color on them. They're not in full spawn mode yet, but they're definitely getting there. And it's an excellent time to fish for them because of their aggression. I want to start with one quick thing here that gets lost a lot of the time and I've I've we've caught flack for it in emails on YouTube from YouTube and TV shows and people say oh well you're fishing around spawning fish you're fishing around spawning fish and I get it nobody wants to catch fish off 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 their reds or their beds as the case might be I am not advocating you do that just because I'm saying fish in the fall around their spawn phase doesn't mean I'm advocating that you fish the ones that are actively spawning <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you've ever seen trout spawn, it will be very, very clear to you what's going on. Long story short, if there's two fish and they're more interested in dancing with each other than you, or there's a you know any of your lures or something like that, they don't spook easily as well. That's another good good clue that they're probably spawning. And then obviously they'll have the the reds or the beds uh, in the middle of the river in certain places. Now, having said all of that. Most of this podcast is going to be about areas where brown trout are not, uh, they don't rely on native stocking or native growing, I should say. They are stocked as well. So in the same, it's the same scenario as we see in, for rainbows in the spring. They get up shallow and they spawn, but very small percentage of them, uh, particularly in the lake and reservoir environments, will be successful. They don't have the running water they need. They don't have the water clarity they need. 
Uh, and so those spawning is almost like a false ritual for them, particularly in some of the lakes in Colorado, like North Park and South Park. Uh, if you're talking about Wyoming, you start talking about uh, maybe the Laramie Plains, Ra- Plains Lakes or Hattie or Twin. There's a bunch of lakes up there, a bunch of lakes on the western slope as well. And I know all over Utah and Wyoming, um, and, and they will spawn. They will go through the motions of spawning but they're not really successful at spawning. The reason those fisheries are so prolific is because the various managing agencies trap a lot of them when they're spawning and they artificially um, uh, spawn them, so to speak, and then release them back into the lakes. And one of my favorite lakes to fish is in North Park, Colorado. It's actually used as a brood lake for stocking around the whole state. And I'm friends with the biologist that manages the lake. I've known him since college. He's very clear to me that it doesn't matter how many trout spawn naturally in that lake. You, you can walk down certain banks and there's trout, there'd be brown trout all the way down the bank. And he says if nobody messed with one of them and they all spawned on their own, they'd be lucky to have a 1% or 2% success rate. Versus if Parks and Wildlife nets them, uh, traps them, I should say, and then spawns them artificially and then fertilizes those eggs and then releases them back as fry, well, now they have a much, much, much higher chance of surviving to adult size. And that's why they go through that process. So again, I'm not advocating you go fish for the trout that are actively on their spawning beds, but I am not also shy about fishing around those areas for reasons I just said. Even in most of the rivers in Colorado where there's less stocking of browns, their numbers are very high. And it's because they do a good job of spawning in some of the rivers in Colorado, the Colorado River being one of them. But even in the river systems, they need lots of free-flowing water, a nice clean bottom, can't have sediment, can't have silt, you know, can't have too warm a water, can't have too muddy water, all of those things that, that inhibit their spawning. And given that we have very few streams that flow freely without a dam on them, uh, it's difficult for them to, to spawn. So enough of that. I'm going to get off of that at this point. Let's talk about actually catching some fish. Same with any other species of fish, a percentage of them spawn at at any given time. So it's not like every brown trout in the lake moves on the bank and spawns at the same time. There's always going to be Uh, some pre-spawners, some spawners, and some post-spawners. And that's Mother Nature's way of protecting the nests and the population um, in the event that, uh, you know, there's a cold front or a warm front or whatever, Mother Nature doesn't make them all come ripe at once. And even Parks and Wildlife knows that when they're sampling them to, to artificially spawn them, uh, they will catch them in waves coming to the bank. So that's a first indicator for an angler of what you need to do. In my personal opinion, the pre-spawners are the ones you want to catch. They're the ones that are very aggressive and they're heavy and they're just in prime, absolute prime condition and they are absolutely beautiful fish. So those are the ones I'll target the most. And somebody's going to ask undoubtedly is, well, how do you know which ones are pre-spawn and which ones are post-spawn? Well, the post-spawners will immediately be returning to deep water and they'll be out on the fringes around the outside of where they spawn and they will literally be beat up and skinny looking. They will be very clear uh, that they just spawned out. In the case of the females, their bellies will be all soft because the egg sacs are gone. Um, The fish themselves, particularly males, will be beat up and that will be very clear to you. So if you get around a bunch of those and you want pre-spawners, fish a little bit shallower and you can typically find the fish that are clean that are coming in to spawn. Also, another way to avoid those pre- or post-spawners is to, because they're resting, just let's let's be candid, They, they went through the motions whether they're successful or not. Now they've got to feed themselves back up, and they'll be more inclined to bite a lot of smaller stuff. The pre-spawners, on the other hand, will grab all kinds of big stuff. And so part of the reason I like fishing them in the fall is I can get away with power fishing techniques. And that's a big part of the meat of what this podcast is going to be about. So how am I going to go about getting big pre-spawn browns to bite? Well, for me, the first bait that comes to mind is a big minnow plug of some kind. Uh, In the old days, I always did that with a big floating floating Rapala, like a number 11 or a number 13 floating Rapala. Now, if you're a trout guy, uh, particularly a a fat part of the bell curve trout guy, that's going to sound like a giant lure. I mean, I'll point out that's 9 centimeters or 13 centimeters long. So it's a great big lure. 
but I'm not interested in catching small and average fish. I'm looking for the big aggressive ones that are willing to fight for their territory or look for a big meal and having a big plug like that will get it done. These days, I, rather than that floating rapala, I can save a whole bunch of money and get a whole bunch of baits that fish more consistently and draw bites equally well by using a Berkeley hit stick, which has a very, very similar action. Uh, it's available in the same sizes, uh, better range of colors, in my opinion, as well, and it's a far more durable and consistent bait. So every one of them I buy is going to run exactly the same, whereas with, with balsa baits, that's not going to be the case. That's one of the first baits I will grab is either a number number 11 or a number 13 uh, Berkeley hit stick. And I will fish it in most cases extremely fast and erratically as a jerk bait. So I'll be snapping it really hard and aggressively with lots of slack line, letting the bait really dance around. There are other times, particularly when it's really calm, that a straight high speed wind followed by a sudden stop, like wind it five or six feet in a straight line just fast as you can and then stop it. And as it floats to the surface, they'll train wreck it. Same thing when it gets to the surface. I've seen a lot of scenarios where right when the bait breaks the surface film is when a big old brown will grab it. As it floats back to the top, it's all motionless, it's floating up and they'll smack it on its way to the surface. That's probably the most consistent way I've ever been around brown trout in running water or standing water to get them to bite is to work a great big jerk bait of some sort. And other possibilities uh, are almost limitless in terms of jerk baits. Everybody makes them. Berkeley makes stunners and cutters and 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 hit sticks and uh, other, every every company makes a jerk bait. The reason I like the hit stick, same as I like the old floating balsa baits. Was, is because they do float, and I can work them very high in the water column, and that generally, it's easier to get those browns to feed up than down. And I think it's because they're moving shallow, they're in shallow water, they really like to feed up uh, or level, not down so much. Incidentally, if I start fishing a bottom contact bait around those same browns, you'll start picking up rainbows if they're in the lake, and that's because the rainbows are in there taking advantage of the brown trout eggs that are being dropped. And but they're feeding on the bottom because of that. And the browns aren't really in there to feed at all. They're in there to fight and make babies, which is why the big plug will get them uh, to bite. So that's the first thing I'll generally gravitate to. Another thing I'll throw at times, particularly if it's really weedy, is a soft jerk bait, um, like a um, uh, well, let's see what a power jerk shad would be a good call or a gulp jerk shad would be a good call. Uh, and the reason being is I can rig that Texas rig. Now you don't see a lot of trout guys Texas ring a bait. And if you're not familiar with a Texas rig, there's tons of them on our YouTube channel at Fishful Thinker. You can look that up uh, or anywhere on, online. But Texas rigging the bait gives me a chance to work it directly through the weeds. And there's a lot of lakes I fish that have a lot of shallow weeds, those kind of pothole style lakes uh, have a lot of really shallow weeds, and the browns will spawn typically right at the edge of the weeds, on the, between the bank and the first edge of the weeds. But these stagers that are coming in to spawn will be in the weeds themselves uh, on their way in. And sometimes, particularly if the wind's been blowing or there's been a bunch of boats through there, the weeds will be chewed up and broken loose. Uh, or if the water level's dropped and the weeds are too close to the surface, I can't get a hard bait through there, then I will throw the Texas rig bait. Now, the Texas rig... On that power jerk shad or gulp shad, uh, gulp jerk shad, I should say, that bait is a little harder to hook fish with, but you're not going to fight the weeds constantly. And since I'm particularly targeting big ones, it's not as bad as it might sound. And the reason it's hard to hook fish is the, the hook itself is buried in the plastic. It requires a more robust hook set. For me, that's not a big deal because I'm a giant, giant, huge, giant advocate of braided line and braided line, whether it be X5, X9, spider wire dur braid, fire line, fire line braid. Um, I mean, there's just a slew of braided lines out there. All of them have one property and that is very minimal to zero stretch, statistically zero stretch. And that means uh, that it's the equivalent of a, of a chain, so to speak, between you and the fish. So when I snap the rod tip an inch at this end, I'm going to get an inch of snap at that end because I don't have any stretch. Also, I don't have any memory with that line, so it lays out nice and straight. Uh, that allows me to pop a hook through a piece of soft plastic in a hurry. It also allows me to work that uh, Berkeley hit stick very crisply 
and it allows me to throw either of them a very long ways in the wind even and still get a hook set without any problem. So the braided line is a really good deal in all scenarios in, in, when it comes to trout because trout are clear water dwellers almost always. Uh, and because trout have teeth, I'm going to put some sort of fluorocarbon leader on there. Not maybe as critical with the, with the hit stick because the chances of a trout getting his teeth on your leader are slim. Um, but the braided line will tangle with the treble hooks. So it's easier for me to put a fluorocarbon leader a foot long that could be literally as heavy as 12 or 15 pound test. It's not so much about the, the, the tensile strength. It's about abrasion resistance and keeping the line off of the hooks. That's really what the big, the big deal is. And that thicker fluorocarbon is a little bit stiffer, and so it works really good for that. Uh, the leader, again, is only around a foot long. I don't even worry about the knot going through the, the tip guide at all. So that's a general system for whether I'm working the soft jerk bait or the hard jerk bait. And when I'm going trout fishing, I typically will carry two, maybe three rods with me if I'm in the boat. I always carry two minimum. Uh, and the reason is I will throw a hard jerk bait, a soft jerk bait, and typically I'll have another rod backed up with something else if I need it. But they'll all be rigged the same way in terms of braided line and a fluorocarbon leader. If I'm going to carry multiple rods, typically I'll carry a medium and a medium heavy powered rod. And a lot of people are going to say, why in the world would you need a medium heavy powered rod to catch trout? Well, for a couple reasons. One, I'm looking for the biggest trout of the year. And two, I'm throwing potentially a 13 centimeter long bait that is very heavy and has a lot of resistance in the water comp. So the medium heavy rod gives me the ability to work that bait without fatiguing myself and make the bait work particularly uh, crisply as well. And then the third reason is the same reason I always advocate heavier than average tackle for trout. Uh, probably one of the few guys out there you're going to hear to say catch them with the heaviest tackle you can. And the reason I say that is trout are not durable and playing fish out is really hard on them. And a, you say 22, 23, 24 inch long brown trout pre-spawn, full, full pre-spawn mode is a formidable fighting fish and I don't want a pansy around with him. He's heading into his spawn. I want him in my net as fast as possible so that I don't. he does not suffer delayed mortality. His blood chemistry is not out of whack, and he's not exhausted to where he's going to go lay on the bottom and, and gasp for air and hopefully survive, which is what's going to happen if you catch that same trout on six-pound test. So my tackle is typically... 10 to 15 pound braid with a 10 to 15 pound fluorocarbon leader and a medium or medium heavy power rod. And with that tackle, I can get a trout to my hand in a hurry. Some people say that's not sporting. Well, okay, maybe it's not. Maybe it is. That's up to you. But you still got to get them to bite. And I say what's not sporting is needlessly killing trout you're not going to keep through delayed mortality. That's the end of my soapbox. Definitely want to get them to hand and release as fast as possible. Also use a fish-friendly net, which in my case is a rubberized Fraybill Conservation Series net with a flat bottom. That way, if a trout is tired or I do have to spend a minute unhooking him or it does take me longer to land him than I want, I can hold that net in the water and it's got a flat bottom, which means it's not squeezing the fish's gills. He can literally swim around inside the net. Even a big one in the net that I carry can swim around inside the net and allow himself to regroup before I let him go without me having to hold him at all and without worrying about tearing the slime coat off and making him uh, susceptible to disease. So that's my, my run on, on handling them. Now, let's talk about a couple other baits. The two key ones I already talked about. And if you take nothing else away from this podcast... Get a big jerk bait, particularly a floating one like a hit stick, and get after them. You're going to catch tons of them. But there's always more than one way to do it. And another technique that, that works well for me, and another one that's that's really different compared to what most people are going to tell you, is a lipless crankbait. Now, you guys may be familiar with those. Uh, most commonly referred or most common iteration thereof is a rattle trap. That's for sure the inventor of the genre. But everybody out there makes a lipless crankbait now. It's a bait you've heard me talk about on a lot of podcasts, and it works very well on a rip and pause presentation for uh, brown trout in the fall. So I'll rip the bait very aggressively, just big, hard, sideways pull with the rod, and then a sudden stop or a stop and go on the reel, one or the other, depending on on uh, you know the, the, how far the bait is from me and how deep the bait is and things like that. But one or the other, a stop and go retrieve, a very aggressive stop and go retrieve with a lipless crankbait can be fantastic. 
I'm going to gravitate to that more when the wind is really blowing because I don't have as much control of my jerk bait in that scenario, whether it be the hard jerk bait or the soft jerk bait for one. And for two, uh, the lipless crankbait's faster in general. I can work that bait faster, which you can generally do in, in windy conditions with any bait, is uh, you can get away with fishing faster. And then three, it's full of rattles. And I mean full of rattles. That's why they call it a rattle trap originally. Uh, and those rattles give off a ton of noise, which can be an irritant. So everyone thinks noise is an attractor, maybe, but it can be an irritant as well. Uh, and that irritant can be very good for getting trout to bite, brown trout to bite when they're, when they're irritable, so to speak, and, and when they're heading into their spawn phase. So that's another excellent bait for them. And then really the only other one I even want to mention, because on any given day I can catch them on any different thing, but there's only these four that I consistently gravitate to because they consistently work. And the, and the fourth one would be a soft swim bait of some sort, something in the three to six inch range probably uh, would be my, my first choice on that. And if I'm fishing around really trophy browns, if I've got a lake that I know has 10 pounders in it, I might throw a bigger one than that. Um, because one thing a brown trout won't tolerate in the fall is a marauding rainbow trout. And so if they're stocking trout in that lake in the fall that are 10 inches long, and you've got brown trout that are pushing 30 inches long, they will eat those 10 inch rainbows or bite them out of aggression and territorialness for the fall without thinking anything about it. And you're gonna think I'm crazy doing that, but I've watched it work, I've made it work a bunch. Even the the Sibyl, the old Sibyl Magic Swimmer back in the day, uh, that company was bought out and the Sabeel was then purchased into the Berkeley lineup, uh, all the Sabeel baits, and the Magic Swimmer is a hard swim bait that I've done really well with, and that's 10 inches long. And I've done really well for that with big brown trout, particularly in the Colorado River. So keep in mind, a great big bait might be your friend in that regard, but a soft swim bait, like a power swimmer or uh, a champ swimmer or something along those lines, on a jig head is an excellent bait, or on a keel-weighted Texas rig, same scenario as with the weeds, right? If I've got to deal with the weeds and I can't get away with the hard bait, I don't want an open jig head there either. So I will Texas rig uh, the soft swim bait with a keel-weighted hook. It's got the weight on the shank of the hook instead of on the front like a jig head. Again, an excellent bait to just retrieve slowly through the weed tops or evenly through the weed tops or, or a start and stop retrieve, one or the other. Now, let me tell you, of those four baits, you notice I didn't mention downsizing anything. I didn't mention anything conservative. Here's why. I don't go brown trout fishing in September and October unless I'm looking for the biggest ones in the lake. And I want to fish aggressively to get those big fish to bite. It's the only time of year that I feel like you have to fish aggressively to get the big ones to bite. Now, somebody's going to send me an email, and it's going to be hate mail, and they're going to be, I fly fish, and I catch uh, big brown trouts on an egg under an indicator. Okay, I get it. I 100% get that. I might walk by and, and pick up a potato chip or a, or a peanut out of a bowl of nuts on a coffee table somewhere, too, and that's exactly what these browns might do. But if you want to catch a lot of them, give them a big bait they can find and that irritates them and that potentially offers to fill them up in one shot or that provides a, you know, provides a territorial threat or something along those lines. I have more reasons for them to bite a big bait than I do a small bait, and that's really what it comes down to. And incidentally, since I mentioned fly fishing, uh, I like to fly fish for them in fall as well, but I do it with big flies. And I mean big flies. We're not talking about little woolly bugs and, and, and little, you know, my favorite little clouser minnows or anything like that. Uh, I'm talking about like sailfish size flies or big giant bass streamers or pike streamers. Talking about something that gives them a reason to bite. Uh, and no, you're not going to catch the numbers with those. If you want to catch a lot of them, throw a little bait. If you want to catch the biggest ones, throw a big bait. And that's not the case always, but that is the case, particularly with pre-spawn browns uh, as they get ready to spawn. And the last thing I'll throw out here is timing. Um, the full moon and the dark moon are going to be the good days uh, because anytime you have a spawn phase, the moon phase is going to count more. And that's going to be the deal here. If it's going to be a full moon, if you can fish in the dark on the full moon, do yourself a favor and do it. That's when you're really going to get after them. 
Also, I'll point out that's when I'll throw the Texas rig baits more because I cannot see the weed edges and things in the dark and the hard bait will get hung up more. If you don't have weeds where you're fishing, don't worry about it. Then you can fish the hard bait. But if you do, fish the Texas rig and you'll be more efficient in the dark. In the dark, I'm really swinging for the bleachers, guys. The big thing is don't get a headlamp on the water. If you can avoid that, you'll be a lot better off. Understand you might get bit right at your feet, and then I'm really going to make sure my tackle's beefy because in no instance do I want to be you know, dancing around with a trout in, in, the, in the dark with a 5 or 10-pound brown trout. I want that thing to me as fast as possible, particularly in the dark. So... It's one of my favorite bites of all. Be gentle with your fish if you would. Get yourself a rubberized net. Fish with tackle heavy enough to land them without exhausting them to the point where they're going to have a hard time recovering. Keep in mind, they're just now going into their spawn. And if you do catch post-spawners, they're going to be weak and feeble, and you need to be even nicer to those. That's why I don't target those. I target the pre-spawners coming in. So if you want to join the conversation and get details on any of these rigs or see videos of all the things I just talked about, you can do that at Fishful Thinker on the YouTube channel. Um, also, if you want to just chat us up and see what we're up to on any given day, that's going to be at Facebook and, and Instagram, both at Fishful Thinker as well. TikTok too, we were relatively new to TikTok, all things considered, but, uh, but we're having a good time there as well. So that's at Fishful Thinker too. So most importantly, guys, if you have Altitude Sports or World Fishing Network, please tune in there. We are multiple days a week on both networks, and we'd love to have you check that out. Uh, it would be very important to us if you would do that. So thanks so much for tuning in. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast. <laughs>